expecting we were going to have an argument, and it turns out that I agree with almost everything that Grant said, so you're in for a bit of a disappointment. The other thing I want to say preliminarily is that I spent, I've never been here before, I'm honored to have been invited, it's an extraordinary meeting, but I spent a good part of yesterday trying to figure out how what I had to say was in any way related to what I was hearing. <laughs> And I, I mean, I know it's not, a necessary, it's not necessary that things fit together, but I was nonetheless struggling, and I decided that to the extent that it does, it does in the following way. There were several talks yesterday about the importance of finding a way to enable people to flourish. And I completely agree that it's important to find a way to enable people to flourish. The question is, what does it mean for people to flourish? And I didn't hear anyone answer that question. And part of what I'm going to talk to you about is evidence that, as uh, Walt Kelly and Pogo said, we have met the enemy and it is us. One of the principal problems that people in the industrialized, affluent West face is not that they don't have the resources with which to flourish, it's that they don't know how, they don't know which resources are the ones worth gathering. Um, and so I'm going to. Uh, that's the extent to which I can connect to what you heard yesterday. And also, if there's time, and there probably won't be, I will draw out the clear-cut and unambiguous political implications of what I have to say. Um, uh, and if there isn't time, then we can, you can ask me a question about it. Um, okay. <laughs> Let me see if I can get this to work. No, I can't. No, no, I didn't. I didn't. Because first we have to do this. I broke into my emergency hidden stash. And I thought about choices. Since birth, modern women have been told we can do and be anything we want. Be an astronaut, the head of an internet company, a stay-at-home mom. There aren't any rules anymore, and the choices are endless. And apparently, they can all be delivered right to your door. But is it possible? that we've gotten so spoiled by choices that we've become unable to make one, that a part of us knows that once you choose something, one man, one great apartment, one amazing job, another option goes away. Are we a generation of women who can't choose just one from column A? Did we all have too much to handle, or was Samantha right? Can we have it all? So this book is an answer to that question. And the answer to the question is no. We can't have it all. And worse yet, the desire to have it all and the illusion that we can is one of the principal sources of torture, of modern, affluent, uh, um, uh, free, and autonomous uh, Westerners. In fact, one of the extraordinarily uh, infuriating things about the fact that we consume a quarter of the world's resources with, you know, I don't remember what fraction of the world's population. That's bad enough in and of itself. What makes it even worse is that it doesn't do us a damn bit of good to be consuming these resources. If at least we were getting something from it, maybe it would, it would only be arrogant and selfish. But it's arrogant, selfish, and counterproductive. So these are the people with whom I have been working. You don't need to see that. So. <laughs> So here is where Grant and I differ. Oh, Richard, the possibilities, as Richard and his spouse stare at an empty room. Out of this empty room, we can make anything. We are completely free and unconstrained. Anything is possible. And the question is, is this good news or bad news? And the answer is yes. I will not waste any of your time talking about what's good about having this kind of freedom, autonomy, and the ability to shape our own lives, because we know what's good about it. What I'm going to focus on is what's bad about it. And I think, indeed, that it's a mistake to view choices that we face as empty. I think if only they were empty, they wouldn't be uh, uh, torturing us in the way that they are. I quite agree with Grant that the kinds of choices we make, even in supermarkets, are non-empty, and that's part of the problem. So to what extent is it a problem? Yes, we all know the supermarket is a source of, uh, is the greatest parity of choice that exists, but I actually went to the trouble, because I'm a scientist, of counting. 
And this is what I found in my not so big supermarket. I want to say a word about salad dressing. <laughs> not only were there 175 salad dressings, but that doesn't, that doesn't count the 10 extra virgin olive oils and 12 balsamic vinegars that could be combined to produce God knows how many other homemade salad dressings if none of the 175 on the shelf suited you. Um, consumer electronics, uh, Circuit City. They have Circuit Cities up here in the hinterlands? Probably not. 110 TVs, 30 VCRs, 50 DVD players, and then if you go into this store to design your own stereo system, choosing speakers, a tuner, amplifier, CD player, tape player, and God forbid, a turntable, you can find in this one store six and a half million different stereo systems. So in the world of consumer goods, we face a great deal of choice. And it's not just in the world of consumer goods because after all, ever since Ford died and you could get a car in more than one color, we've always had choice in the world of consumer goods and now we just have more of it. In addition to that, there are other areas of life where there used to be no choice, where now there is. Uh, phone service. There are some, must be some people in the audience old enough to remember when you could get any kind of phone service you wanted as long as it was from Ma Bell and you rented the phone instead of buying it. Those days are long gone. I guess this is progress. <laughs> now if you haven't seen a phone MP3 player, nose hair trimmer, and creme brulee torch yet, <laughs> you can be sure that one day soon you will, leading to this. In the world of healthcare, we are now in charge of our healthcare destiny. The ideology of modern medicine is patient autonomy. You lay out the options, you the doctor lay out the options, and the patient gets to choose. The most dramatic evidence of this is in the advertisements that we see every day for prescription drugs on uh, broadcast tele on everywhere. Think of how, we, how weird it is that people should be wasting money, drug companies should be wasting money advertising products that we can't buy. Why are they doing it? Because the expectation is that what we will do the very next day is call our doctors and demand that they switch us from medication A to medication B. We are in charge. There's a lot that's good about this. Arrogant paternalistic medicine had its downside, but there's also a lot that's bad about it because the burden that it imposes on each and every one of us to make decisions about something about which we know almost nothing is a terrifying burden, and it's a burden that falls predominantly on women who seem to be in charge of their family's health care. Retirement plans. There used to be one pension. Maybe there were two choices you could make. Now enlightened employers are giving us more and more different funds to choose from. And I, in a few minutes, I'll show you what the consequence of that is. The liberal arts curriculum, I'm embarrassed to say that we now bring students, 18-year-olds, into our institutions who know absolutely nothing about anything. And we give them thousands of courses from which to choose. Because after all, it's up to them, not us, to determine the direction of their educations. They don't know what to do. They know they don't know what to do, but they choose nonetheless. And they end up having nothing to talk to one another about except where to get served alcohol when they're underage because they have no shared intellectual experience. We have much more freedom and flexibility about where we work and when we work than we ever did before. And again, it's obviously something that's very good about that. And I suspect that this audience, more than almost any other I could imagine, takes full advantage of this flexibility. But what that means is that at every minute of every day, we are faced with a choice of whether or not to be working. Where you are is no longer an excuse for not working. The time of day is no longer an excuse for not working. That you are already doing something else at the same time is no longer an excuse for not working. And I don't think this is good. We are now in charge of what we look like in a way that we weren't before. I mean, you used to have control over your physical appearance, the clothes you wore, but now you get to shape your body as well. You can take, if you have too much tissue in one place, you just suck it out and you re-inject it in some other place where you don't have quite enough. 
You can paralyze your facial muscles to make the lines go away. Anything is possible. And what this means is that personal appearance has become a matter of personal choice and personal responsibility. And what that means is that if you're unattractive, it is your fault. <laughs> Unattractiveness is a matter of choice. Didn't used to be. People could always choose whether to marry, and they could always choose, having decided to marry, whether to end their marriage, and they could always choose whether and when to have children. In the old days, however, although these choices were available, the default assumption was so powerful that most of us, most people, didn't feel like there was any choice. There was a choice of mate, but after that, the program just ran its course. You got married as soon as you could. You started having kids as soon as you could. That is no, uh, it's obvious that none of that is true anymore in our society. Should I marry or shouldn't I? Should I marry now or should I marry later? Should I have children or shouldn't I? Should I have them now or should I have them later? Each and every one of these decisions is a very consequential decision and a very real one in the minds, at least, of the students that I teach. Enough so that the amount of work I assign in my courses is about two-thirds what it used to be because they need to spend a significant portion of their lives answering questions that I didn't realize were questions when I was their age. Religion comes in a lot more flavors than it used to. <laughs> I'm embarrassed to say that I actually did this to my, I, tor I tortured my kids in this way. And even identity, who we are, is much more up for grabs than it used to be. We don't automatically inherit the indent identities that our parents gave us. We are free to re-identify and reshape ourselves on almost a daily basis. <laughs> so this is modern life. And I want to say that I think Grant is absolutely right. Cheese and crackers is not an empty choice. And if it were an empty choice, the problems that I'm focused on wouldn't be such problems. People could dismiss them. These are consequential decisions because they tell the world something about who we are. No matter how trivial the decision may seem, it says something to the world about you, or at least some people think it does, and that makes unimportant decisions become important decisions. And this creates the paradox that my book is about. We have more freedom. Americans have more freedom of choice than any people ever has anywhere on Earth before. We also have more money than any people anywhere on Earth ever has before, which is not insignificant because uh, freedom without the money with which to exercise choice is a kind of empty freedom. So this is, as you would imagine, the best of all possible worlds. Well, no. Americans are sadder than Americans have ever been before. Depression, clinical depression, is more than twice as frequent now as it was a generation ago. Some people have estimated that it is 10 times as frequent now as it was a century ago. And this is also true of suicide. Not only is the frequency of these things higher than ever before, but it is also being observed in younger and younger people than ever before. And I think that there, there, this is not a coincidence. I think that the problem of making choices makes a direct contribution to the fact that in the face of plenty, uh, Americans are more and more dissatisfied with their lives. What does too much choice do? The classic study involved buying jam at a gourmet food store in Palo Alto. They, uh, this store would set up a little table of, often where people could sample new products and then um, They'd get, if they wanted to buy the products, they could. And uh, experimenters set up a table that offered uh, a, imported jams. Um, and one week, there were 24 different flavors of this jam sitting on the table. And if you stopped by, you could sample as many different flavors if you, as you wanted. And then you'd get a coupon that would give you a dollar off on any jam you bought. The next week, same setup, except instead of 24 jams, there were, there were six. You could again stop by, sample, and if you like the product, you could buy jam and get a dollar off. And what these people found is that when there were 24 jams on display, more people were attracted than when there were six. 
more tasting, more coupons, and one-tenth as many people bought. And so this profusion of choices produced a kind of paralysis. Which jam should I buy? Loganberry, boysenberry, quince, whatever the hell that is, blueberry, <laughs> orange. How am I going to decide? I'll buy peanut butter. <laughs> convenience stores. If you go to convenience stores and convince them to offer fewer different kinds of cola, fewer different kinds of pretzels, and fewer different kinds of potato chips, what you find is that you sell more stuff and the people who buy are happier with their purchasing. Offer less variety, sell more goods. Speed dating. <laughs> you know what speed dating is? Men and women get together in a room. The, I don't know, women sit at a table. The men rotate. It's like a square dance. Every eight minutes, you move to the next table. You have an eight minute long date with somebody. If you both sort of hit it off, you give the organizers your email addresses, the organizers give them back, and then you know, maybe it proceeds and maybe it doesn't. So this is a very, in these busy lives we lead, this is a very efficient way to collapse a year's worth of dates into a single <laughs> evening. So a study was done. In one condition, you had 20 dates in an evening, and in the other condition, you had 10 dates in an evening. The duration of each date was exactly the same. The question was how many matches got made and the answer is the more dates people had, the fewer matches. Your people applaud. This is good news. <laughs> and final, the final example, and this is really very consequential, um, 401k investment plans. A colleague of mine got access to Vanguard um, uh, records for individuals and found that if you look from one employer to another, there's a lot of variation in how many different funds the employer makes available to the employee. So the question was, how does the number of funds that are available for choice affect people's willingness to participate in these voluntary plans? And what she found is that for every 10 funds that are offered, the likelihood of participation goes down 2%. If you offer 50 funds, you will have 10% fewer employees participating than if you offer five. And in many cases, not participating means passing up employer matching money that can be as substantial as five or $10,000 a year. It is so hard to decide which fund to choose that people end up choosing none. And this is, of course, a disaster for practical purposes. So one of the things that too much choice does is it makes it impossible for people to choose. With all of this choice, people may do better if they can finally pull the trigger, but they will feel worse. You do better objectively, and you feel worse about the results of your decision. And the question is why, and there are several reasons why. One reason why is regret. You choose the boysenberry jam, you take it home, it's good, but maybe the blueberry would have been better and you regret not having chosen the blueberry. And what that does is it subtracts from the satisfaction that you get from the boysenberry. Is that what I said? Even though it's a perfectly good choice. So regret poisons good results. And even worse than that, anticipated regret, the worry that you will end up sorry that you didn't choose the blueberry, makes choosing itself altogether impossible. So. And this is part of what I mean when I say choices are not empty choices. If you're going to have to eat that salad dressing from now until the end of time, it's not an empty choice anymore. <laughs> and you sure don't want to make the wrong decision. Second, what economists call opportunity costs. Anytime you make a choice of one thing, you are passing up attractive features of other things. Lost opportunities, missed opportunities. And the more attractive alternatives there are, the more opportunity costs there will be. The, and these will accumulate and detract from the satisfaction, again, that you get out of what might be a perfectly good decision. <laughs> there is an ice cream place in Vancouver, this is one plus for Canada, that offers guess how many different flavors of ice cream? No, 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 no. 
five, zero, zero. 500 flavors of ice cream. Well, the opportunity costs associated with choosing any one of those flavors would be devastating. This is somebody who appreciates opportunity costs. <laughs> and next comes uh, people who appreciated them a little too late. My final example and my favorite is a very New Yorko-centric one. <laughs> I mean, think about it. Here you are in the Hamptons. The beach is gorgeous. The sun is shining. You're sitting there having a wonderful time, or you should be having a wonderful time, but all you can think about is that it's August. Everybody in your neighborhood is away on vacation, and damn it, you could be parking right in front of your building. So that's an opportunity cost of going away when everyone else goes away, and it makes you less satisfied with uh, the choice that you make. To, make. to get serious for a moment, at places like Swarthmore College, where I teach, where students ha are multi-talented, they're really good at a lot of things, and they're interested in a lot of things, I have learned that the one question you don't ask graduating seniors is, so what are you going to do when you graduate? And there's a reason that you don't, and the reason is that these people for the first time in their lives, they're going to have to close some doors in order, in order to walk through others. And it is desperately important that they choose the right door to walk through, but they can't bear the thought that by doing so, they'll be closing other doors. And so they agonize over the question, what's the right thing for me to do? What's the right decision? What's the right path for my life to follow? They can't make the decision. And so they become the world's best educated Starbucks coffee sellers. You know, what a college education seems to do in the United States is it enables you to leave working at McDonald's and go instead to work at Starbucks. <laughs> While you wait desperately for the answer to the question, what should I do with my life, to emerge. And it doesn't emerge, which is one reason why uh, uh, colleges and universities find themselves absolutely overrun by requests for psychological counseling. Counseling services in universities cannot meet demand. And I think this is one reason why. Opportunity costs and stress at work. Stress at work costs about $300 billion a year in medical bills. Parenthetically, I never know how people come up with estimates like this. So what I find is that when these estimates suit my purposes, I assume they're right. <laughs> this is the way science works, people. Now, a lot of this stress comes from overwork, people work too many hours, and from job insecurity, at least in the modern economy. And I think these are very significant, but I don't think they are the only sources of stress. I think that an underappreciated source of stress is the, is the fact that work now for many of us, for many white collar workers, involves choice. The choice to work at every minute of every day. Should I be working or shouldn't I? You can work anywhere, you can work anytime. Whether or not to work is always a decision. There you are, watching your kid play Little League. Your Blackberry is attached to this hip, your cell phone is attached to this hip, your laptop is on your lap where laptops are supposed to be, and even if you don't open any of them, every minute you're watching your kid play is a minute where you're also thinking about whether to make the phone call, whether to check your email, or whether to do whatever the hell you're gonna do on your laptop. And this creates a kind of pressure on people that I think they have a very hard time uh, uh, bearing. The next problem with all this choice is that it causes an escalation of expectations. And the example I'll use for this is my own efforts to buy a pair of jeans at The Gap some years ago. I was used to buying jeans when they only came in one flavor. You went in, you told them your size, you got them. You suffered with discomfort for several weeks until you broke them in, and then you wore them for as long as you could because you didn't want to suffer from that discomfort again. And so I went into the Gap, and they said you can get them easy fit, relaxed fit, slim fit, boot cut, tapered cut, zipper fly, button fly, acid wash, stone wash. 
So I spent an hour trying them all on because I figured, damn it, if they were going to make them in all these different flavors, I, I should get the best ones. And I got the best fitting jeans I had ever purchased. I did better than I ever had before. And the weird thing is that when I left the store, I was less satisfied with the purchase than I had ever been before, honestly. And the reason is that I used to have no expectations about how good those jeans were going to be. <laughs> now I figured if they're making them in all these varieties, one of them ought to be perfect, damn it, and none of them was. And so the mere profusion of choices inevitably gets us to raise our expectations. And satisfaction with decisions is often determined by how, not by the objective results of the decisions, but by how the objective result of the decision lines up with what our expectations are. And if expectations keep on leaping ahead of objective results, at best we're running in place, and oftentimes I think we're falling behind. Some examples of the consequences of high expectations <laughs> created by all this choice. I want to say a word about New Yorker cartoons. The reason I show them, aside from the fact that they get people to laugh, is it's a way of showing you that I'm not the only person in the world who has these thoughts. Travel agents. <laughs> <laughs> Contractors. <laughs> Leading to this. Now, the, I don't want to romanticize the past, but the sense in which everything was better back when everything was worse is that when everything was worse, people's expectations were much more modest than our expectations are now. So it was actually possible to have experiences that exceeded expectations. It is no longer possible for people living in our society to have experiences that exceed expectations because expectations are so high. Here's the alternative view. <laughs> Finally, finally, you go out to buy something, you make a choice, you bring it back, it's disappointing. It doesn't live up to your expectations, and you have to ask this question, whose fault is it that this choice failed to live up to expectations? When you're choosing, as I did some years ago when I was vacationing on the Oregon coast and I had to buy wine to bring home for dinner, and there were five different bottles of wine from which I could choose. And I brought one back, and it wasn't very good, and everyone agreed that it wasn't very good. And the question was, whose fault is it? And the answer was clear. It was the world's fault. The world had only given me five options, and they were kind of mediocre. Well, you go into a liquor store that offers 20,000 different bottles of wine from which to choose, and you choose one, and you bring it home. And again, objectively, it was, it's surely better than any of the ones that I had available to me in the Oregon coast, but it isn't as good as people had hoped. And so, once again, the result is disappointing, and you ask the question, whose fault is it? And now the answer, it seems to me, is just as clear and inescapable. The fault is yours. There is no excuse for failure in a world in which the choices are essentially infinite. There is no excuse for anything less than perfection in a world in which the choices are essentially infinite. When we experience failure, relative failure, and we ask the whose fault is it question, we come up with the answer, the fault is ours. And this, I think, is the causal link between the profusion of choices we now face and uh, in the increase in clinical depression. The paradox in all of this, almost done, I hope, is that what really, really produces flourishing, what really makes people happy, what really produces satisfaction, is close relations to other people. That's the single most important determinant of well-being that anyone has identified in, in uh, 40 years of research on the determinants of well-being. And the thing to notice about close relations with other people is that they constrain. They don't liberate. What it means to be close to someone is that you are not free to make all of these choices for yourself. You have to consider the needs, interests, and desires of the others. And so your choice set is limited by the fact that you care about other people and other people care about you. Now, I used to think that being, being in a network of close relations to other people was so beneficial and so valuable that having choices constrained was simply a price worth paying. 
because the good, what was good about it was so good. I now think that in the modern world, it isn't a price at all. In the modern world, in the world that we live in, in affluent societies like this one, anything that constrains choices is itself a benefit. One of the benefits of being involved with other people in an intimate way is that it limits your possibilities. And we are now desperate for things in society that will limit our possibilities. Why are people getting married? Well, you don't need to know that. See, this is what you're missing. If Grant hadn't taken too much. <laughs> I'm almost done. Just two, a few more slides. How can choice be both good and bad? Uh, it's absolutely good. I, I, I conceded that at the very beginning. Here's how I think it can happen. Our experience with good things is that is, is what economists call diminishing marginal utility. So if you look at the curve that starts low and goes up, on the x-axis is the number of choices we have. On the y-axis is our subjective state. And so living with no choice all the way at the left of that graph is infinitely bad. You can't be a human being if you live in a world in which you have no opportunity to determine your destiny. As the number of choices we have in life increases, our, our well-being also increases. But you can see that the marginal benefits of additional choices eventually become negligible. They go almost to zero. Adding more and more options doesn't increase our well-being. At the same time, this is the, uh, the hidden part of the relation between choice and well-being, with each additional choice we face, there's a negative to it. Uncertainty, regret, raised expectations, all the things I've just talked about, that's the curve that is going down as you move from left to right. And the thing about that curve is that it escalates. The more choice you have, the bigger the negative effect. And so the net result of, uh, on us of the amount of choice we have is simply the sum of those two curves. And that's what it looks like. Going from no choice to some choice dramatically improves our well-being. But a point is reached where well-being actually crosses the zero point and starts to go negative as a function of increased choice. And we, as a modern affluent Americans, have long since passed that point. So you can be anything you want to be, no limits. You're supposed to laugh at this and say, how stupid is that parent fish telling its little baby fish in this little tiny fish bowl that there are no limits? You know, we're supposed to be sophisticated and wise and laugh at people who have pinched and parochial views of the world. And that was the way I reacted to the cartoon at first. And then I started to think, well, whatever the cartoonist might have intended, in fact, parent fish is right. The truth of the matter is that being anything you want to be is only possible within a world in which there are limits. You shatter the fishbowl, take all the limits away, and it becomes impossible for the baby fish to uh, realize its potential. The baby fish could be stepped on by a kid, eaten by the family cat, uh, brain dead from lack of oxygen. I mean, there are all kinds of wonderful things that can happen if you shatter that fishbowl. It is only within a set of constraints that the realization of human potential is possible. And we have, as a society, moved in the direction of assuming all constraints are bad, and our task in life is to shatter as many constraints as possible. The result has been to make us more and more dissatisfied with life, even as the material circumstances of life get better and better. So thank you very much. Sorry I took so long.